Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon is growing all around the world. This is episode number 431. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. And we are drawing closer and closer to our spring conference, aren't we, sweetheart? Yes, we are. We've got we've got it up on the KIB site. Uh, you just go under conferences, and it's the first one. And in fact, I've uh, shared the information on that one, uh, the one with Hear the Watchman that happens in April, as well as uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Mike Spaulding's Go There For conference that's going to be in July. And uh, we've got a lot of good things ahead. We've uh, I'm excited about this conference. We've got uh, Carl Gallops coming in and L.A. Marzulli and Vicky, and Vicky Anderson. And uh, we're going to dig deep. The theme of the conference is do not be deceived. And I tell you what, that's going to be hard to do in the days ahead when you're literally living in a society that is nothing but a stew of deception. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take the power of God. And we wanted to announce, too, um, that when you register, uh, we've got a couple of things that you have to click. There's a place like if if you need gluten-free food and things like that. Uh, And so if you don't receive a confirmation email, you need to... Contact Steffi there uh, and let her her know so we can figure out what's going on. Sometimes it'll go in spam. There's different things that go on, but but you need that confirmation for, uh, to be assured that you're registered. Uh, we've got some people saying um, that they eat kosher, and and some people may just that's a use broad term that sometimes to say clean because we don't eat pork, we don't eat shellfish, we eat according to Leviticus, but there are some people that follow a kosher diet to where like they have separate things in refrigerators. Well, that that would be rabbinical Judaism and I Well, I I don't know. And yeah. because different people do it. We we, we had somebody we that Moses. came to our ministry one time and they worked with a group and they even had separate refrigerators. They didn't combine the Dairy and meat at Dairy all. Dairy and meat, and so we don't we don't do that, you know. So that's something that you'd have to yeah. have to and consider. I've, I've but jokingly all of said our... forever that you know Moses said you can have a cheeseburger, you just can't have that bacon cheeseburger, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, we've got the the menus figured out, and so we're we're working on everything, and we just wanted to give a couple of um, quick statements about our protocols. Uh, somebody had um, written me and, and was asking about like if there could be a um, clothing exchange or something like that. And we don't do things like that because of things that we learned years ago. You know, when I first came out of my um, my depression and I was, you know, making it through all the transition of my healing, I just had people coming out of the woodwork trying to give me their clothes. And there were a couple of people that that it became apparent who they were. And so after that, um, we we discovered that people in the occult will um, do rituals with clothing and give them to other people, and it's like a relay point for curses. You know, in the by it's a counterfeit of where they had aprons and things. They would lay them on people and pray, and they'd be healed. Um, then we also learned a few years back that over in Africa, uh, the witch doctors uh, will throw clothing out, they'll throw coins out, and so that they can transfer th- through that to somebody that would pick that up, transfer sicknesses and things like that. So we've just learned to follow those things. And, you know, in a normal setting, that would be a great thing, but, but it's one of the things that we've just asked people not to do, to bring clothing and exchange it. To We have another protocol, um, unless someone has a staff sticker on, uh, we ask that no one will will pray for others and lay hands on them unless you are staff or a speaker. The reason we do that is because um, you can pass on spirits. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's witches have really infiltrated a lot of the charismatic movement and other sections to where they just show up and lay hands on people. And next thing you know, these these people end up with other spirits other than the Spirit of God. Well, there are a lot of churches. I heard somebody do it the other day to a little clip I was listening to, and they said, just lay hands on, on the person next to you and pray. We would never do that. 
even in when we were having our, our services, just a, f- a few people locally, we, we always said, please don't, don't do that because, and especially because we've dealt with programmed multiples, which are people that were traumatized and, and they, their soul was split. They were, they had personalities that were created in them that were trained in the occult. That front personality that you would meet wouldn't even know that they had that going on. Their, their amnesia, they have amnesia to the things that happened to them and don't recognize those parts. And so imagine that, and I've met many of them in the last years, many that are in ministry, and they don't know this has happened to them. So they're sitting there, and, and I'm sure not um, it, with maliciousness, just laying hands on people and praying, and, a, and the back personality uses that to transfer and i mean they're highly trained they know what they're doing you know people that say that there's no such thing as spiritual warfare oh i just i pray for them because i want to know what planet they're on well it's it's, 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 we we just tend to blind ourselves to the reality i mean we were oblivious to most of this stuff that we've learned you know i we were raised in churches where they they said that Taught about the victory of Jesus, Satan can't touch you if you're saved and things but none like of them that. Had it. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, none that we were around, <laughs> um, but we've learned a lot, and so we put these protocols in place uh, because we just we've learned it through the years, and and it's that way you don't have to call people out. Um, you know, this way you just make a protocol and everybody follows the protocol. And even though there, there will be many people at these conferences and many people I know that I would have no problem with them laying hands on someone and praying, we just have to make it a blanket protocol. That way you don't have to hurt someone or we just, we just do it that way. Yeah. And so if, you, if the people coming would just know that and abide by that, we'd appreciate it so much. Um, you know, the spring conferences are more difficult uh, than the fall conferences. And I think that's because there's such a um, huge amount of occult activity during that time. You know, you've got Lent, and people are going along with the Catholic Church on what we we believe is the um, Weeping for Tammuz yeah. days leading up to Easter. Um You've got, you know, right now we've got signs all over the place where the churches are going to have Easter egg hunts. And, you know, the denominations they're in, if they didn't do those things, they'd get kicked out of the denomination. You know, that's just, that's their protocols. That's how they do things. And they use that as a um, evangelistic, evangelistic tool. tool. Uh, and so we are not uh, putting anybody down. We're just praying for everybody because we used to do the same thing. We, we didn't know any of the things we know now. We know now that the occult can use that, and and they they build great power, especially if they can get Christians to do something yes. that is a pagan origin, but they're calling it in the name of the Lord because he has specific scriptures that he says, don't do this, don't take the pagan things. And it's just like Disney. Now people can kind of look at Disney because of the later things that they've produced and say, boy, this is wicked. It's always been wicked. It's always had witchcraft. It's always had, they just prettied it up. And, you know, that with him being a 33rd degree Mason, which a lot of them have, have pretty much validated in many ways, uh, I've never seen that. Um, the only thing I've I've seen verified is that he's demolay, but there are people that say he was yeah, 30, 30 degree. As well as him having the 33 club at both of the, mm-hmm. the Disney World and Disneyland. Um, what he what he portrays in his movies about the fairies and all these, that, that was his religion. Mm-hmm. And it is very obvious to that. And I remember when Tom Horn went down and went into the 33 club and he'd done, these were millionaires and billionaires that were part of that. And he got to talking with them. That they believe all of it. That that's their religion, and so he used um, the cartoons to teach our children his religion, which was not the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it, it's the ancient. It's the ancient religions. And we can see those kids that were in the Disney Club and how they went on to be singers and actors and things, and and they've suffered as a result of that. I think many of them are, are program multiples themselves. Uh, and so we've had, you know, many years of this going on. And what we've found out if, you know, we've got new listeners is life is so much easier, so much easier if you can separate out of those those type of things, separate out of the 
uh, Easter egg hunts separate out um, from the the pagan holidays. Um, you know, most people think it's not what it means to me, and so that. It, but the, the occult is, yeah. use it. They they say, well, it may not be what it means to you, but you're still participating in what has a pagan origin. So we have a legal right to attack you there. Yeah, theologically, God nor hell cares what you think and what it means to you. Um, you know, it, it's the same thing if we had, let's say we had a guy come in that had continually committed adultery on his wife. But he said... That's not what it means to me. We would be up in arms. Well, you mean that's not what it means to you. But because it it is something that is part of a culture that has been candy coated and Satan has kind of, you know, wrapped a warm fuzzy around it because it's not against us but it's against God, we think it's okay. And you know, when when uh, this, this Mary, this is a time and I, I love that God has been having you go into the prophets and study uh, I've been doing the same thing, and we've, we've kind of converged on, on what we're talking about today. Isaiah and, and Jeremiah both were writing it, written in times that God's people had adopted so many pagan ways and had in many ways abandoned the things of God. Now, they did, they did a front kind of, you know, like, like when you read in Isaiah, it says, I'm sick of your offerings. He said, I'm even sick of your feast. Now, they weren't his feast. They had transformed them into something else. They, they had the outward expression, if you will, over here of this little segment to where they were doing all the right things, but, then, but that made up about 20% of what they were doing. And the other 80% was, was pagan, and it greatly offended God. The New Testament doesn't change that. that that's why when the Apostle Paul, uh, he talked about, guys, there's going to come a day that we're going to need God in our midst. We're going to need God in our homes. We're going to need God within our, within our community of faith. And the Apostle Paul says, here's how you do it. Touch not the unclean thing. Now, thing, if you look in the King James, when he, this is out of 2 Corinthians, thing is italicized. So that was added by the translators because they were trying to make sense. They weren't Hebraic enough to know that when Paul was using a Hebraic theological term when he said, touch not the unclean. Anything the Old Testament said was unclean was encapsulated in that word, which also includes pagan worship. I mean, it, it includes a lot of things. It includes hygiene. It, it includes so many things that God said. If you're, if you're living in, in, in community, in a community of faith, all these things are unclean keep them out there. If you'll keep them out of the camp, I'll be in the camp. Mm -hmm. Well, Mary, if there was ever a day that we need God in the camp, yes, it's we right do. now. We do. Uh, and before we get into to what we're going to talk about, I wanted to give you an update on the, the family that has COVID. Uh, it was looking very grave last week. Uh, the doctors weren't given hope. Uh, they they even went through the process the the protocols in the hospital where you decide, um, you know, at what point are they in are they suffering and you need to take them off the ventilator. They went through that, and good news yesterday. The last report we got is they had planned on that yesterday afternoon, and he had enough improvement that they've delayed it. So that shows that God is working. I I've not personally heard of that going that far into that to where they make it. And so because he is improved, I believe God is working. And, you know, sometimes um, there's, there's situations where ventilators can harm the lungs too. So I'm asking God to just go ahead, go ahead of that, go ahead of that, bring healing every day, bring restoration every day to where he's strong enough that they, they can take him off the ventilator and he makes it on his own. And nope. so we thank you so much for praying. God's hearing our prayers. Guys, just keep on praying in there with us. You know, one of the things that I've, I've been praying about, when, when I was a teenager, I had acute bacterial bronchitis and ended up going in, into, the, into the hospital for a while, and it had scarred my lungs. And I remember when I had joined the Army at 18, there was an hour, everybody else was being processed. They set me over on the side, and they were making phone calls and all this crazy stuff. 
And, and I asked him, I said, you know, what's going on? Because it kind of had me concerned. It's like, am I a communist to don't know it or something? You know, it's like I've, I've been relegated over here. And they said, we're making sure that you're you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the, the uh, x-rays that we had when, after you came out of the hospital, there was scarring on your lungs. There's none now. And, and we, don't, we don't know why. And I said, I tell you why, because I remember the day that the power of God hit me and God healed my lungs. And, and the army validated that miracle and saying, we don't know if this is you because there's no scarring on your lungs. So what I've been praying for Austin is, God, if you did it for me, you can do it for that boy. Yes, he can. He can. And so, and that, so I've been crying out for that. So we are praying for that. And also the mom and dad are had COVID too, and it takes a while to get your strength back. Yes. Plus they have the, uh, the burden of this, the, the heartbreak of watching your child go through this. And so let's just pray God strengthen them supernaturally, give them peace that passes their understanding. Father, take them through this. And, and we're just believing, continue and declare life and health and healing in yes, Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I also want to, um, to pray for Haiti. Um, you know, they're having such an uproar over there. That I know they're worried about Haitians coming to, to Florida, and there's a lot of that in the news. I, I sense in my spirit that God can use this to expose what the elite have done over there. Yes. Um, there have been horror stories told about what the elite have done there. And so I'm asking him, Father, ex- let this somehow expose everything that's been done to where it cannot be hidden, but that it shouted from the rooftops. You know, we're in that place where, um, you know, we're asking God for mercy because our nation is in such a mess. And... Um, he, I, I know what God's doing. I mean, he is, he's given us the opportunity to see the debauchery, to see the depths of the evil so that we will rise up and stand against it. And the good news is, is when you can hear Alex Jones say that people are waking up, that's a really good yeah. indicator. You know, I think one of the things that I think we need to concentrate on our prayers is gangs. Gangs is the problem in Haiti. Gangs are, for the most part, in their problem in all South America. That all, that you know, there's there's this intermingling of really good people that just want a better life. And and bless their hearts, you know, that that I'd like to see that for anybody. It, but the, we have we have gangs in America. Uh, it's like all the violence that we're seeing now in, let's say, Chicago. They have the strictest gun laws on the books. Now, what they haven't thought through, I don't, or maybe they have is that gangs do not abide by the law. They never have, they never will. And so there's this systematic effort, and I've seen it in other, in other nations. They take away firearms from good people, but they, they can't. In fact, we, right now we have in, in some cities, Mary, the gangs have better armament and equipment than our police force. And many of them... Uh, have uh, served in the military because they were they they were given the choice either go to jail or go in the military. Well, not only now in the military they went into special forces, and then they go back and they take that training and they give it to gangs. We need to start praying that God would begin revealing all the gang stuff going on here in America and in other countries, so that their that so that their nations can raise up and put a stop to it. Although I think part of the plan here in America with with all the what the elite are trying to do, they're going to use gangs as well as the terrorists that are coming through to try to create absolute chaos. We need to pray against the chaos. We need to pray against the gangs, uh, and and for. We need to pray for our leaders that they would have this come to Jesus moment where they would have this epiphany of, of turning things around instead of empowering the wrong things because that's what they're doing right now. They're empowering the wrong things. I, I know I'm, I'm working on my book on, on coming out of Babylon. I'm kind of using it to take through things. As, you know, It's like, why do we pray when the a, when a nations of the world are stuck on bringing chaos and destruction? Every policy that I'm seeing, not just in America, but in Europe and all these different places, Mary, they're, they're setting up now under, let's say, under climate control or climate change. 
they're they're setting up for famine and starvation because they're they're suppressing farmers. They won't let them have fertilizer. They won't let them have diesel to run their their uh, their equipment. Uh, they're trying to restrict how many cattle and uh, and it's like you're setting up the world on purpose. We need to realize that the world is drunk on the on mystery Babylon right now. They're drunk on the wine of the horror of Babylon. And they want chaos. They, they, they need to have this chaos to bring forth the son of perdition. But what I, what I love when, when I was studying on the priesthood of the believer is that when God told Adam and Eve to replenish the world, that's Malay in Hebrew, which not only was to, you know, it either can be fill it up or refill it, it can mean either one, but it, it also spoke of uh, being equipped as an army, being consecrated as a priesthood. And when you look at the Hebrew letters that make Malay in Hebrew, and then, now this is the staff that was returned to us by Jesus. It is the shepherd's staff that can stop chaos. Believer, that's what's in our hands. Mm-hmm. If we, if we return to the right things and we pray the right things, we have been given the authority of Jesus because we are under authority that, that the things that we do can literally stop chaos in its tracks. Well, I believe that the mighty prayer warriors that are our listeners, I believe we can move mountains together. Yes, I and really we, we've do. seen God move some mountains. I, I am seeing God moves so mightily and so let's not forget that in the midst of seeing all this you know as you were talking about gangs i've seen some of the greatest uh transformations out of gangs people yes. that get saved and and are so um mighty for god oh i, I get tickled when i hear about mario marilla out there and i mean they're leading gangs mm-hmm. and they actually had two rival gangs that would normally have killed each other if they saw them on their streets and they're sitting there crying ball getting at the altar together f- finding jesus mm-hmm. it, we, we need to see more of that happen in our cities mary well we do and and i also um i just asked for your prayers for the spring conference and i plan on doing much more prayer um because we need it i i know there was an outside force that I think um, has been taken care of on that last spring conference there where people had headaches. And, you know, that's one of the things that you can tell when there's a witchcraft sting a lot of times is, is you almost always get a headache because it's, it's they're, they're coming against your mind. They're trying to attack, and, and you'll get headaches a lot of times. And so I'm going to be on top of that. I'm prayed up, and I'm getting the, everything done ahead of time so I can and put that's my focus. We encourage everybody to join us in the prayer, too. Please pray We, pray we want a visitation us. of God from this conference. That's right. And um, I also wanted to pray, you know, as you've seen these things on uh, TV about the airlines, we just had one where there was another thing that, that fell off of a plane. And this was a 25-year-old plane, so it was the normal maintenance, but it's, it's gotten to the place I'm where it's I'm wondering ridiculous. if they've not got infiltrators um, in the factories that are purposely leaving off bolts and things like that to cause disasters. And, and so far, I mean, God's mercy's been there, and, but we need to ask that that be exposed. Okay. If there's anybody been placed in, in factories, because um, years ago when God was showing me the panoramic view of the judgment that was coming to America, one of the things he spoke to me was he said, planes will fall out of the sky like raindrops. And so um, I've known for a long time, okay, we've got to be praying over uh, the airplanes and things like that. And, and it would make sense to me that the enemy would try to place people in, you know, nuclear facilities, for example. There would be strategic places they would want to place people to cause as much damage, damage as they can. And so that's one of the things I'm asking God to expose. And the good thing that I see is if God wasn't, didn't have a plan to turn America around, to to get us out of the Babylonian system and turn us around so he can use us on the world stage before the Antichrist gets set up. I, th- I think that's why the exposure's here. And man, too. is everything getting exposed. I mean, it's just one thing after another. And, and I believe it's, it will get to the point. Now, right now, they're still covering. They're still saying these crazy things. You know, that President Trump just said something about a bloodbath talking about um, 
something in Mexico and the car, the car industry, and they totally took it out of context and blew it. I mean, it was like they showed this clip of all these people saying this, and I thought they took that out of context to make it seem like if he doesn't win, there's going to be a bloodbath, and that was not what he was saying. And what it, what it has done to me, it's like how, how many times do you have to lose all credibility uh, investigative journalism is dead in America. Well, I think if you went to the general population, I think they would agree with that. But I think that the people that are in charge of the media are still just pumping the same. They don't, they don't have another agenda. I don't think Satan had a backup plan. He had, no. for centuries, led everything up to this time where he says, I'm taking America down, and I got it. I, then I, I can move quickly throughout the world. And I think what God is saying is there's covenants. Yes. I and think. so he is working to get this this nation back to the place where we can fulfill a covenant. Yes, I do too. And so so that's where I think we are. And I wanted to, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and read just the scripture where God took me this yeah, week. Yeah, because I've been kind of holding back because okay. I don't want to get ahead of what, what you're <laughs> yeah, wanting and I, to do. And I think that's all I was going to say on that part. Um, God took me to Jeremiah 15, and I'm just going to read down just a little bit. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. This is talking about, you know, his people that have gone back and do all the pagan things. <laughs> and it shall be, if they say to you, Where should we go? Then you shall tell them, Thus says the Lord. Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord, the swords to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of the heavens, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. I will hand them over to trouble to all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem, or who will bemoan you, or who will turn aside to ask how you're doing? You have forsaken me, says the Lord. You have gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting. And that's yes. what struck out to me that God was, you know, we, we sit here, and I, I know you guys are like us. Don't you just get sick of this? Don't you just get sick of one thing after another? You know, Congress has, got, has come up with all of this evidence all of this corruption and stuff. Can't get anybody to do anything about it. And so imagine God looking down on what's going on. And, and you know, time and time again, he's given us mercy. Man, have we had mercy over the last 30 years. I've watched it. I've seen where God, God's hand, you know, he was removing his hand, and I'd see his mercy come in. And, and you know, there comes a point when he would be tired of that. He would be tired of that. And so we're, we're at a critical juncture uh, because never before have things been exposed like this. Never before has there ever been a time when everything's in our face. You know, back, like I've told you, 30 years ago, I couldn't even find stuff to try to figure out what had happened to me. I, I was just, you know, having to listen to God and say, God, show me with my eyes so I can understand what's going on. Now it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It is out there. The the horrors that they've done with children and adrenochrome. You know, it's the drug that they that when they take the blood of the children that have been so traumatized that that they're to the point they're going to die, and so their their body excretes this adrenochrome, and they take that because then they get some kind of high off of it. I think that they can they use the the blood of children to make themselves look younger. I've seen that. I've seen that in Hollywood, and you can just tell it because, you know, aging is a process, guys. And when you see some woman that's 70 years old and she looks like she's 30, there's it's something beyond plastic surgery. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and they do that a lot. Um, they use, you know, the occult, People will use children as, as uh, shields. They, they don't have normal instincts. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, that we're looking at. And, th and that's, that's who's in charge of everything. These type of people are in charge. And so it's, this is why God is saying, now, I'm going to give you a big chance here. I'm going to expose exactly what these horrible people have done. And this is your chance to get out from under this judgment. 
I'm exposing it, but guess what? I gave you authority down there. I'm expecting you to do something about this. And you know what? That Through the years, 30 years ago, what I would see over and over and over is I can't look at that. I, I, I can't look at that. I can't stand to look at it. And I understood it. I understood where people were coming from. It's so horrible. It rocks your world. Uh, it, it, you can't go through a normal day anymore once you look at this because you're sitting there thinking, you know, how can I, how can I go through this day like nothing's going on? And I know this little child over here is being tormented and killed. And you, when you see that, I mean, it was a big transition for me, a big transition to get out of, I'm going to go find these people. and Because, I mean, that's just how God made me. I can't just sit if I know something's going on and not do something about it. And I understand how difficult it is because for one thing, a spirit of fear has absolutely gripped most people in this nation. And and they may not act like it, but when, you know, if, if Satan shows up, they're going to be just beside themselves. Yeah. Because they, they, they've they been taught, okay, I, I've got victory over Satan, and, and he can't do anything to me. And he shows up in your bedroom, and, and there's something there, and, and you're paralyzed, and you're shaking you know, so hard you can't even breathe, and things like that. Then it's real to you. And look how far we've come. You know, there's, a, there's a story with Smith Wigglesworth that uh, there was a horrible storm. I mean, it's one of those ones that it's impossible to sleep, and it sounds like the whole world's coming to an end. And so he goes downstairs and Satan appears to him in the middle of that storm. Smith looks at him and says, oh, it's just you, and went back upstairs and went to bed. Well, when you know your authority, yeah. that's, that's kind of your attitude. Yeah. And not to get, uh, you know, you don't ever want to be cocky or anything like that because you got to recognize the power that's with the kingdom of darkness. But when you also know your authority, even if people are coming after you, you know that you've got authority to pray and, and bind up what's behind them, and, and God thwarts the plan every time. We've seen it with us over, over, and, over and, and over and over. And that's why I try to encourage people, don't let fear come in. Don't let fear grip you. Fight it. Bind it. Command it to, to loose you because, yeah. because that will stop you from doing what God wants you to do. I, it's the main factor that the kingdom of darkness uses to try to stop you. Fear there, is, yeah, fear is the currency of hell the same it, way that faith is the currency it of hell. It is. It is, and, and fear will bring along with it other things. If you take on a spirit of fear, you're going to have sickness. You're going to have all kinds of things that work with it. I call, it, call them the underlings. Fear's a, a big, uh, powerful thing. It doesn't, I, it, it's not like a principality or something like that, but it, it has such a, a way of attacking your mind, attacking your body, that, that it, it carries power with it. So the powerful spirits have underlings, and they'll work against you. Like if you, if you let fear in, it's going to bring stuff to make you sick. It's going to bring stuff that, and so, you know, that, that wasn't, I mean, there were th- things that I've, I've always had fear about in my life, just normal things like I don't want to get bit by a snake, you know, things that will make you be cautious. But, it, but I'd already been through so much that, um, that I had blocked in my mind once that was unblocked and those parts came up, all they, all they were saying is, take me to the battle. Get me there. Now that I know how to defeat these people, you get me there. That's all that I was hearing. Um, and that's and that's how I I operated, and God just took me from one thing to another. You know, I was I was going through deliverance. I was I was saying, okay, whatever they've done to me, I ask forgiveness for my sins, any sins that were done to me, and and you're leaving me. And and so as I I was getting to that place, um, it be, it became. It it just was my way of life, and and guys, as hard as it is to believe. I feel like I can lead a pretty normal life. Yeah. I don't wake up every morning. And, and I know but people, I, I think people said that, uh, you know, in that town I was raised with, I think that there was so much fear there. They, they couldn't believe anything I was saying was true. So they had to just say, well, Mary lost her mind. And that was probably a good thing because I think as long as they said that, Satan was leaving them alone. Um, but I didn't lose my mind. And, and I give all glory to God for that. I did not show signs of instability ever. I mean, I was standing right in front of these people. You know, in 2005, I went in a, a motel, a big hotel where they were. I knew where they were, and I went in there, and I, my, 
My goal was is I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and one of us is, is not gonna get their stuff done tonight. I'm gonna sit here and pray over all these kids in this hotel and and you're not gonna get your stuff done. And and I never did know what happened as a result of that, but they didn't kill me. They didn't they didn't destroy me. And so I've I've just not had fear where that's concerned because God's I've just followed what God told me to do. Now I, it would be stupid to do that unless God was telling you and you knew that it was the will of God and He was backing you. Um, but that's that's the way I've I've made it through this, and I, I I'll hear from people a lot, and they're just terrified because they're they're targeted and they're and they're having things, um, you know, put in their minds, and and they feel like people are watching them and stuff like that. They they probably are, but you know what? God is your protector. He's your shield, and and your key to getting past that fear, your key to making it on, is you get in the Word and you find out what the Word says. And you find out, you just start from one side and you go to the end of the Bible and you'll find out that even though there was judgment that was, was harsh in the Old Testament, he was trying to keep people alive. That, that God only did the judgments. He always prefers mercy. He did judgments so that, that we could survive. When you get this much sin going into place and this much debauchery, it wipes cultures out. It does the very sin itself. I mean, it's you know part of it is God doesn't have to move. When, when sin has finished its work, it brings forth death, mm-hmm. and we 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 need to realize that the only reason that that we're still here is by the grace of God. And you know, I I think we're in this because I'm I'm going back. I'm reading a book of the Church in Babylon by uh, by uh, Lutzer from he's the pastor of uh, Moody church up there and a really a good book and and uh, there were several things he said in there that triggered me to do more research you know we always love to talk about uh, how josiah turned things around I, I love this story of josiah okay he's ends up being becoming a child king and he finds out one of the prophets over 100 years before he was born actually called him out by name and said he's going to turn things around mary in his day the hills were filled with pagan altars. The, the temple of God and all the instruments of divine worship were laying in ruin. And the temple was filled with pagan idols. They had lost, they didn't even know what the Torah was by his time. They had lost it and, and they had no idea how to serve the God of Israel because they had become so paganized. And he found out that he was named by the, by the prophets, and so he said, well, we, we need to fix up God's temple. And in and the, and the rubble, they found the Torah. And I, I look at that because there has been a, a revival in the last 20, 30 years of us going back to the commandments of God. You have to have Moses and you have to have Jesus to, to be a proper balanced body of Christ. And he cleaned the temple he, he went and he tore down all the altars and, and everything else and reestablished. And the Bible says that when he heard the Torah, when the people heard the Torah, they began to weep and cry. You see, there's a remnant that when they, they uh, and I, I have seen this at conferences, when, when, the, when, the, when the speakers move beyond the whatever the, the pablum is that's going on Christian television right now and all the gimmicks and all that, and, people, and, the, and the men of God return back to preaching the word of God. And it can even be good stuff, okay, not, not just judgment and everything, Mary. I have seen people in the congregation begin to weep and cry. It was like in Josiah's day. It's like we're hearing the true word of God mm-hmm. again, mm-hmm. and it is so wonderful, and it's so precious, and they begin to cry. That's what happened in Josiah's day. But, you know, the next generation, see, Josiah was establishing a fork in the road. The next generation had a choice to take what Josiah had started and go to the next level or return back to the dung of Babylon. And Mary, they returned back to the dung of Babylon Mm -hmm. because it's the next generation all of a sudden God has to raise up Isaiah and Jeremiah and many others, and then, then they begin to warn. Just one generation later. And... One of the things that I'm concerned about is we have, there is almost a jaundice in the, in the, in the I know in, in a lot of denominations there's, there has been cronyism go on with the old guard in a lot of denominations. 
And let me let me let me put this out. If if any organization you get to the place to where you're covering up sin to protect the organization, that organization needs to be shut down. It's no longer glorifying God. You're serving an idol. And you can call the denomination, you can call it First Baptist, First Pentecostal, First whatever. And there has been some of that going on, but there's there's this jaundice of the younger generation against the older men of God that have been faithful in the Word of God. And there, there needs to be a balance that... And I remember saying this at True Legends that that my heart and I know the heart of many others that I that I serve with, we want this next generation to take all the good things that we learned, and as well as how the enemy operates, and we want you guys to stand on our shoulders and to take it in another level, not to go the way of the world. Mary, there's a lot of churches out there that represent how Judah was before the judgment of God. Oh, especially now. They're they're goat farms. You couldn't mm-hmm. find a sheep in there. If if you if if you tried because it, it is a it is a goat farm with the name Jesus over the top of it, mm-hmm. and the word of God is not praised. Some of it some of it is is the, this paganism. Some of it is they have gone into rabbinical Judaism instead instead of true Hebraic understanding of the word. Some of it is they have gone into entertainment. All these different things. The, the I think the beginning of it was the seeker sensitive movement that we need to be sensitive to what the people want. Well, that's what God judged the Levites for to Malachi. They were teaching the people what they wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear. And we, we see so much of that. It, it's, they, they have enough of the outward maskings to make you think it's a church. That's what was going on in Isaiah's day. That's what was going on in Jeremiah's day. And you would have false prophets, Mary, that would stand up. And even though their courtyards were filled with idols and paganism, and they were 80% pagan and 20% Jews, if you will, they would get up and say, but we have this covenant with God, and God's not going to, to allow us to, to be taken over. God's not going to allow us to be judged because we have this covenant when they're violating the covenant. Well, but they, you know, years ago when I, I was trying to tell people, listen, God's telling me that there's judgment coming. They just say, say, we're under grace. You know, and I remember there was that one church we went to just for a brief time, then it, it closed down, but... Um, there were people there that were saying, you know, we, we like to go to uh, to nightclubs and we just like to dance and we don't we don't drink or anything. We just and I'm thinking, what in the world would you want to go to a nightclub for? That atmosphere, it'd be full of sin central. And so and and so, what did the church do? They had enough people in there saying that kind of stuff. They made the church the nightclub. Yeah. And you've got people up on stage dancing like Michael Jackson and. And, and doing all the all of these songs, just like the world. I mean, it's Babylon Central. And I, I think David Wilkerson is right. One of these days, it's going to come to where they're going to literally undress, and it's going to be more like a strip club than a church. Well, and my concern for for the people, you know, there are people that have just been raised up in that, and that's all they know. And and we know by experience, if you have these kind of doors open in your life, if you have not examined your life, examined your your iniquity on your bloodlines and things, and repented, and and uh, you know, I was so grateful God gave me that prayer initially when I first came out of that depression at, to ask Him to cover the doors in my life. Yeah. Because I mean, I was trying to clean up the best that I knew, and I had no idea the doors I had. Uh, we were still doing all the all the pagan holidays and, and things like that. And I, I can tell you this, and this is the truth, don't ever try to do what I did in 2005 by going in the middle of these people and you're still doing holidays. Don't do it because they, they'll know it and they're going to know exactly go right where to, to go after you. Yep. But, but I mean, that's, that's what, I mean, God is, he's weary of relenting. Yes. You know, God's people have been crying out. We've been crying out, oh, God, we just ask for your mercy, and time and time, and he has. But it's got to the point now, you know, there for a long time, okay, people don't know this stuff. So God's mercy, mercy. I mean, it's in our faces, guys. Yep. This is in our faces. Let me read out of Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 2, because this almost, remember when all the cities were burning during the, uh, the 2020 election? It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, the children that I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. 
a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are, t- they are utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? So it's like they're already beginning to see the results of their sin, and they just double down. Kind of like why we see a lot of things in America right now. Things, things, are, you know, things can get a whole lot worse, but they just keep doubling down. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, which I think refers to leadership. The whole head is sick, and the heart, and the whole heart faint. For the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate, and your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land, like coming across the border. It is desolate, as overthrown by foreigners. The daughter of Zion is left with a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a, in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the interesting things I, I, I uh, ran across this last week studying Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of it as kind of like two small ancient towns. Sodom and Gomorrah most likely had a population of over two million. It was a metropolis mm. that God judged. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teachings of your God, you people of Gomorrah. What is to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, saith the Lord. I have had enough of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. In other words, they... They were doing all the outward things that were easy to do to make it look like they were serving God and all this other stuff. And God says, I'm sick of it. I wonder how many of, one of the things I've been asking God here lately, because you know, there, a lot of times when I want to go back and, and to really enjoy praise and worship songs, I've got to, I've got to quit listening to the Christian radio and I've got to go back and pull it up on iTunes on some of the stuff I already have. And, uh, I was praying and I said, God, how much of this modern worship do you consider as worship? And I could hear the Holy Spirit said, not much. Why? Because it's all about us. It's not about him. It's about making us feel better. Are there's, are there's simply bad theology that heaven will not recognize in these songs? Or bad resonance. There's bad some resonance. bad resonance on them. Uh, they, the, the, it has the reverberation of hell in, in, instead of heaven. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I've shared this before. I can't remember if I've shared it on a podcast. I know I've shared it when I'm teaching. But have you ever been in services to where all of a sudden it's like heaven just took over the praise and worship and just heaven fell like, it's like you walk out of there saying, man, I have been with God today. Praise and worship continually goes on in heaven. Mm-hmm. When a praise and worship leaders are attuned to the Spirit of God, we start singing with heaven, we we start what what whatever the theme is that day, whatever the theme is that hour. All of a sudden, we start we start changing and we start praising and worshiping that lines up with heaven. You can't come in line with heaven like that without heaven coming down. And I'm not talking about Holy Ghost goosebumps. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of you know, I, I just got goosebumps. What I want is people falling on their faces and getting right with God. I want to see, you see, I want to, my heart is, I want us to get in so line with heaven. And I, I think the remnant's going to do this. Our passion has to be Jesus. Our passion has to be his throne. Our passion has to be his word. That when we, we get in line, Mary, I want to start seeing cancers dry up. Oh, uh, that's going to be, I, we're going to see it. We'll see it. You know, I, I read the, the uh, revivals of Charles Finney, that a sinner you know, when whenever he was in a town and they began to and revival began to break out, sinners would just simply walk through town because they had to go to the grocery store and they would never make it. That they would fall down in the middle of the street, begin to cry out to God, and they would weep and they would lament. And finally, somebody had to come out of their house and lead them to Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's when heaven comes down. I love it. I, I want it to be like when they were dedicating the temple, Solomon's temple, that the priests could not stand a minister. You know, we, we, we've got to get away from having these cults of personality in the church. You know, and I, I jokingly have said before that 
uh, when I when I saw that going on, I just decided not to have a personality. <laughs> But uh, and then sometimes you know you've got to interpret people for me because I'm 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 a nerd who got saved and I'm as quirky as the day is long, and and I love what the apostle Paul said to the Ephesians and you really got to read it in the Greek to get the understanding because it paints a picture. He says, "Follow me as long as you can see Jesus over my shoulder and realize I'm following mm-hmm. Him." And the the implication there is. When you look over my shoulder and you can't see Jesus, run. Yeah. Run. Because in the days ahead, guys, you need to listen to me. God's getting ready to judge a lot of things because we are at this fork road. Mm -hmm. We are at a place that either God can bring revival and and if the church will judge itself, it allows God to go ahead and judge the world. Mm Mm-hmm. But if we refuse to judge ourselves, he's going to have to judge us and then judge the world. Yeah. There'll be a remnant, though. There's going to be a remnant. But we're going to see a lot of men, and I think we've already begun seeing the, the beginnings of this. We're going to see a lot of men that we thought were on the cutting edge, and they were they were on the cutting edge of hell, and we didn't know it. And God's going to judge them. Mm-hmm. Your faith has to be in Jesus and Jesus alone. Any human being is subject to sin. That's right. Is subject to temptation that, that, that can yield to that and get off. I'm, I'm constantly conscious of that with me. That I, I know Mike Lake can get stuck on stupid sometimes, and, and that's why I, I daily say, Lord, help me overcome that. Help me not do that. Me help, me, help me stay true to you because I know I'm human. Yeah. I'm not divine, okay? I'm human, and I can miss it. Help me be quick to repent, quick to correct, quick right. to let, 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 let it so grieve my spirit when I have grieved the Holy Spirit that I can't stand it. Yeah. And, and as, we're, as we're approaching judgment, that needs to be our heart cry more mm-hmm. because I think, I think when God is saying, listen, I am tired of relenting, I am tired of postponing, Look at the grace of God in, before Isaiah and Jeremiah. He rose up Josiah and got it all straightened out. And like, and I think that when the Apostle Paul talked about how a dog will return back to his vomit, I think he was talking about Israel in the times of Isaiah and Jeremiah. God corrected it, and they went right back to the paganism. They went right back to carnality. They went right back to the flesh. The remnant aren't going to do that, Mary. I want more of Jesus. I want oh, more of the word. I, I want to learn yeah. the, the, you know, the reason I keep the commandments is not to be saved. The reason I keep the commandments is because I am saved and I want to honor my king. Yeah, for sure. I don't want to hurt his heart. I don't want him to look at Mike Lake and be grieved and saying, how long am I going to have to suffer with this yeah, guy before I bring him to the right place? Me neither. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to, I want to learn more. I want to go deeper. Um, you and know, I, I want conviction. I do too. I want it. And and God does convict me. There's times I have the wrong attitude about something. And and I ask him to correct me and he and he does and I repent because I I don't I I'm too old, you know. <laughs> I'm too old and, and we're at a pivotal point in time. Yeah. I don't I don't want to stumble again. I don't want to go back to anything, you know, that was, was I was in bondage to before. I, and, I, I um, want to bring joy to the heart of God. You know, as parents, and I don't know what it is about teenagers, but a lot of times you got to nag them and 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 nag them. Then they roll their eyes when they do the right thing. Okay, it's 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 part of the, I guess, the teenage process. But there comes a day, you weren't looking, you weren't expecting, and they're going and doing the right thing without mm-hmm. you having to nag them. Mm-hmm. I tell you what. If, if a parent is honest, when that happens, your heart is about to explode with joy. It's true. And if it brings that much joy to our hearts, think how much joy does it bring to the yes. heart of the Father when we get to the place where, Father, I, I, I may not feel like doing this right now. My flesh is tired. I'm old and I'm tired. And I need every, every joint I have has needs WD-40. But I'm going to do exactly what you said, 
because I just love you. Mm-hmm. And, and boy, we do. And love it you. is part of my duty as being a part of the family. Yeah, that's right. And and you know, and he you know deserves what? everything we have. Now, now imagine. We we have most of the church running around, and they're they're almost like Jacob went right before he was wrestling with that angel. Here he comes, so blessed that it takes a caravan, and he wrestles God all night long for another blessing. the The church is 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 we'll throw money at it. We'll do all these things. We'll do everything but to simply be obedient. The Bible says that if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. And so, you know, when I read that, I said, okay, God, make me willing. Your word says you will cause me to will and to do your good pleasure. I stand on that every day. That as honorary as Mike Lake is, the Holy Spirit is bigger. And he can work on me to cause me to begin willing. Uh, I know when we got married, we were both standing on the scripture, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. We didn't really understand the impact of that. Because when you delight in the Lord, he gives you all new desires. Yeah, he does. And and he takes you through a, a cleansing time so that your desires will be his desires. You and know, because that, that wasn't the way it was when we first got married. And so we, we had to walk through, but boy, God was so faithful. He's so faithful. And he can do anything. He can do anything. You know, I remember when, when I first came out of that depression and we'd went and visited a church and there was a prophet there, I believe a true prophet of God, and he came up to me and he said, God has changed your bloodline. And he said, and you're going to move in great faith. And I, I, I just thought, oh, well, that's good. And then I thought, well, why would he have to change my bloodline? And then that, you know, I learned everything that was there. And I learned, and, and think about the miracle of that, yes. guys. He changed my bloodline to where all of that did some kind of miracle with my bloodline to where none of those spirits could even be around me for a while. I had like eight months of bliss, absolutely learning the word, soaking up everything I could. Then he had to change it back. Because I had to fight my way I, out. I love what he said, okay? I taught you what to do. Now go get them. Well, the, and that was essentially what it was. And, man, it was rougher. On, at, in August, when, when it turned around, it was rougher than it was when, when I started. But, boy, I'm telling you, I had the fight on me, and I knew my God. And I knew if he could do that miracle, he could do anything. You know, I've, I've kind of went over my mind that moment. If we could see heaven... And we could see the father up there. I could see him nudging an angel and said, you're about ready to see something real special. <laughs> because well, he, he did. I cried out to him and I said, you're almighty God. Is there anything you can do to help me? And it was a miracle. Yeah. He did, he did a miracle. I don't even know if my blood type would have been the same. Who knows? But, but I'm telling you, he backed that stuff off to let me know what it was like to be free so that when it came back, I would have crawled through glass. I would have done anything to get to my father. Yes. And that actually shows you how much can flow on bloodlines. You see, we're, we're so, we have become so narcissistic that we haven't realized what we do in our lives the attitudes, the things we allow in just do not affect us. They can affect multiple generations yes. after us. Yes. There, there's something about DNA and the blood and the bloodline that the spirit realm can attach to. Now, the bad news is it can go to three or four generations according to the Old Testament. The good news is when you quit doing that stupid stuff, and start and fight your way to the kingdom and establish the kingdom. If you establish it, God says if you do it right, it can go to 100 generations. Right. You and see, the, the one thing that I will tell people about that statement, though, thousand generations, you know, because, because Jesus made the way for the curses to be broken. But what I've seen with people is even if they, like if they're Freemason descendants, and even though they, they haven't joined it, they, and, and they may be in the fifth generation, those, those spirits hover. Yeah. They are so uh, after your bloodline that they will hover looking for any yeah, opportunity. Open the door so I can start yeah, this open process the door. all over again. Open the door. Get get this door open so I can come and, and live with you again. And so that it, it takes a fight. It takes a fight because they don't give up easy. They want the home of the bloodline. You know, I, I love the symmetry of the word I'm, I've been just meditating on in, in Revelation where God says, come out of her, my people. And... That's actually at the beginning of the book. Genesis, God visits one guy. Now, he, 
He had, at the Tower of Babel, he divorces all humanity. He gives them over to the following principalities and powers. And he says, I'll make for me a nation. And he finds a guy named Abram. And what's his call? Get out of Babylon. Come follow me. I'm going to show you something that you can't even wrap your head around. You want to talk about a man doing something that would bless up to a thousand generations? We're in the body of Christ because Abram walked out of Babylon. Mm. We're in the body of Christ because one day after he believed for over 40 years to have a son, God says, go sacrifice him on a mountain. And he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son for God. The Bible in the book of Hebrews say that he believed that he was going to see that boy raised from the dead because it was out of that boy that was going to become a multitude of nations. He believed God when it was impossible to believe God. And because he was willing to give his son, and this shows you how God works, Mary, the very spot, the very mountain that Abraham built an altar to sacrifice Isaac, one day stood an old rugged cross. Exact same spot. He was a Gentile. That he became a Hebrew when he crossed out of Babylon. Mm-hmm. The call of the believer is to come out of yeah. my people. And, and there's a remnant coming out. There is. You'd be surprised, like when, you know, like it's it's like what I just explained about when God changed my bloodline. I can't even explain to you the difference in how life felt. And well, and see, it's well, a we similar, knew it was a miracle because I even looked better. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be a similar thing when people recognize the Babylonian system and start making those decisions to get out of it. You're going to find a life that you've been dreaming of. Yeah. It's gonna, and we're going to see the remnant rise up. Right now, we're still in that process. The remnant is going to rise up and move in unbelievable power from God because he's going to know he can trust us. Yes. And, you know, the, it's, always, it's always blown me away. Okay, now, Abram messed up, and he went down to Egypt in the middle of a famine. That's where, you know, I know this is my sister, not my wife. And, and God turned that situation around. And so now he's coming back out of Egypt. And so you had all these pagan nations around him, these, these pagans. And as he's going back through, they're coming to him and saying, we're cool, right? We're, we're, we're not coming against you. We're, we're cool, right? In other words, because he was beginning to discover who he was and that he didn't need Egypt and he didn't need these things, he didn't need the world system, but he, he, he only relied on God, there was a transition beginning to happen in his life that even the enemies of God around him feared oh, him. preach it. And then later on, when Sodom and Gomorrah, two million population city, was taken captive. That wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah, was it? What? I don't know what you're... Yeah, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. When the, when the four kings come down and they, were, and they were actually most likely descendants of the Nephilim, they come down and they, they capture Sodom and Gomorrah, they capture a lot. Okay, so you had the king of the king, you had four kings and four armies. And he had gotten so strong in God, he said, let's just round some boys up. I mean, I, all he got was out of his household, his, his servants and, and his family. And he went down and took on four kings and one. And then when the king of Sodom said, I'm going to make you rich, he says, let no man make me rich but Almighty God. In other words, I, I don't need the world. I, I don't need your, your filthy lucre. What God does in my life is more than enough for me. And Mary, it was after that that, Melchizedek showed up and showed him the mystery of the bread and wine, which I believe was Jesus. And that moment, I think that was a transitional moment in, in Abram's life. Right after that, God changed his name to Abraham. But I think in the bread and the wine, I think that Melchizedek sh- shared with him about the power of resurrection and the power of what was going on. Because the book of Hebrews says that when he was ready to offer up Isaac, he'd, he believed that God was going to raise that boy back up from the ashes. There had never been a resurrection. Where did he get that? 
And I love how Carl Koch teaches. He, he goes deep into the Hebrew in that moment when he was raising up the knife. And God yelled out, Abraham, Abraham, or Abram, Abram. Carl can look in the original Hebrew, and it says that he looked across the offering, he looked across the altar, and he saw. You know what he saw, Mary? He saw the cross that would one day stand on the same site. He saw God give his only begotten son, and he saw the empty tomb. And Carl so eloquently teaches that that was the moment that Abram got saved. And Mary, it was right after that that God gave him a new name. You see, there's, there's a new name that God's getting ready to give you guys. The name that you had was one that was given to you by Babylon. And it said, you're defeated. You're full of torment. You're caught up in the world system. You're going to be carnal. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. And when God gets a hold of you, he begins manifesting a new name. In fact, we're even promised that in the book of Revelation, that one day if we overcome, we'll be given a new name that only us and God knows, that he has a pet name for us. And in that name, I believe, is our destiny of who we were supposed to be. This is what the world called you. This is what Babylon called you, but this is what I call you. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the world may call you defeated today. God calls you a victor in Christ. The world may say you're nothing, and God says you're my child. You're the son and the daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you're a priest, you are a kingdom of priests that I've not only consecrated you as priests, but I've equipped you as an army. And I'm going to have a people, and they're going to be holy. And they're going to overcome the Antichrist. They're going to overcome Babylon. They're going to overcome the world. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? You see, the world may whisper in your ear, I'm overcoming you, I'm overcoming you, I'm overcoming you. But when you listen to God... He's saying, if you hold on to me, you'll overcome the world. Mm -hmm. You'll overcome the world. That's right. You'll overcome the world. And there's a world overcoming anointing right now being released in the body of Christ. For the remnant, regardless of what happens, God can bring us through. He will always have a remnant. Now, we need to understand that you know, I've had some friends that teach that America is the great Babylon. Let me tell you something. Babylon is worldwide. You go to, you, can you run to Canada? Canada's gone communist. Can we, can we run to South America? It, it's all run by gangs. Can we go over to the, to the European Union? Well, they, they have gone. I mean, they're setting up everything for the Antichrist system over there. Mm -hmm. uh, can we go to China? Well, they're communists. Where can you go? Can you go to Antarctica? Well, if you listen to Steve Quayle and others, uh, the watchers and the Nephilim are down there. Don't go there either. Where can we go? We stand where we're at. We stand where we're at because the kingdom of God is within us. That we have to come out of Babylon first in our hearts and in our minds. And then when Jesus comes back to rule and reign physically, we're going to be out of Babylon because he's ruling and reigning in Jerusalem and Babylon will not be tolerated. Because we're going to see the day that Babylon is destroyed. Now, all the merchants, all the politicians that absolutely drive you crazy, all the, all the banksters and the gangsters and the, and, and the, and the, and the uh, corporations that literally look at us as nothing but commodities. That's what the book relates. Mm -hmm. That's when you read that. that we're, we're nothing but a commodity to them. That's why, oh, yeah. Mary, we, even, even in, 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 uh, in how to handle personnel with companies, we no longer have a personnel department we have a human resource department because we're nothing but a commodity to be chewed up, spit out, used, or whatever. But you see, in God's kingdom, we're sons and daughters. That whole system's going to come down, and they'll weep, and they will mourn that they can't do that anymore. They can't make their filthy lucre off the souls and the bodies of humans and, and using fear to manipulate us and everything else. Well, you know, if they're gonna, they might as well start getting used to it now because I have decided— that I'm not going to be moved by fear anymore. 
I'm going to be I'm going to be moved by faith. I'm going to hear what God has to say, and that trumps anything the world has to say. They may say I'm nothing in Him; I'm something. They may say that I'm defeated in Him; I'm a victor. They may say that my voice doesn't matter. But you know what? If heaven hears me when I pray, who are they? Who are they? We, we, we've got to change this attitude. We're still thinking like we're slaves in Egypt. We still think like we're, we're in bondage in, in Babylon. But Jesus translated me out of that kingdom into his. That's right. Although I'm stuck on planet Earth, and it, it may stink like fish on ice right now, I'm walking in the kingdom now that when I pray, heaven moves, that, that, that Jesus taught his disciples when you pray for somebody in their hill, say, the kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of God has come near you. Come on in. Come on in. That means we should have an atmosphere of heaven around us. Mm-hmm. I think we have so played down because we have listened to the whispers of the enemy that we have fallen so short of who we are. And I'm not talking about having an ego, and I'm not talking about being puffed up. The Bible says, don't think of yourself higher than you ought to think. It's because of him. The more that I learn to bow at his feet and submit to him, the more his kingdom can surround me. That's right. That's right. We do have victory. We do have victory. It's just letting him get us to a place where we're safe to flow in it. Because we've had so many doors open, it wasn't safe. Yeah. And I refuse to bow to Babylon any longer. I will. Mm-hmm. I, I bow to my king. That's it. Babylon didn't die on a cross for me. Babylon didn't save my soul. Babylon didn't heal my body. Babylon, all it ever wanted to do was to enslave me and pat me on the back and say, aren't you glad I turned you into a slave? No, I'm not. I was freed by my king and by the sacrifice he did on the cross. And now I live for him. I'll die for him. And my, my, my days are numbered and they're held in his hand. Because if I'm so caught up in him and I'm so make sure that I'm encompassed in him, the enemy can't take me out of here before I'm done. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do something stupid and end up dying early. But that, that, if you stay in obedience, if you stay, if you oh, stay right. in the kingdom, then he, he knows exactly how long I'm supposed to be here. He knows exactly what I'm supposed to do. And see, the, this whole thing for this to be worth it. It's not building a big ministry if it's not for him. It's not doing all these things. My, well, the, the thing that I want to hear the most is one day when I stand before him and I say, and I hear, well done, mm-hmm. my good and faithful servant. And we're actually coming into a season of victory. Um, Purim on the Jewish calendar is this next weekend. Yeah. And it's a time when we all sit and, as a family and discuss the story of Esther and the miraculous thing that, that God did. And, and that's what we need right now. We need the anointing that was during that time for this period right now. Yeah. Because there needs to be a turnaround. There needs to be those that have done this evil get caught in their own traps. And that's what I'm praying for and declaring, Father, this is, this is your established season. Yeah. And let that same anointing be fulfilled. You know, one of the things I have decided, and I've, I've, I've studied the, the Zadok calendar that was with the Essenes, and my, you know, one of my concerns is they don't do the beef barley harvest. And so it's out of sync too. Even though, I mean, there's some things that are, that are very interesting. And I think they got prophecy right about when the Messiah was supposed to come. But one of the things that we have seen, you know, this, this whole thing started when God told you that they're getting ready to desecrate the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm-hmm. And that was on the traditional Jewish calendar. But one of the things I found I find fascinating is that every time God does something supernatural, it's and all I got to do is open up my calendar, and it's not the Zadok calendar he's going by; it's it's the current one. And I think that because heaven established what's going on in Israel right now, that he's respecting that calendar. And I think that when it's time for whatever calendar they end up coming up with, if if let's say you know heaven moves. And they decide it's time to go back to the beef barley harvest and start doing it God's way again. Then I, I think maybe the prophetic things have changed. But the, this the number of things when you when you listen to Jonathan Khan and others, just it, it and and how the fiftieth uh, year falls on all that and all these different things. Every single one of these feasts are on the traditional Jewish calendar. Well, the um, this 
major eclipse that's coming up is on the first day of the first month. Yes. And and now I know that that the occult use those things and they will be planning they I think that's I think that they have known that it was going to form this X and that's why they would they would talk about time X. But let me tell you something. God's in the business of turning these things around. Yes, and that is. and that was designed by God. That's not designed by anything else. These things are designed by God. Yeah. And so I think that's a pretty good indicator and I think we're going to stand and watch God's hand move in a mighty way. And you know, so we're going to we're going to just go by the traditional calendar until Israel changes it uh, or until God changes our mind. And it'll, it'll have to be more than something coming out of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm, I'm going to have to see where it, it's got to line up with Moses mm-hmm. or it ain't right. Okay. Well, and, and we do have the practical side of this that with observing the be barley harvest, then it can change and well, it, it can move from one day to another. Well, you if you have a job... They aren't going to go for that, that you yeah. schedule a day off, and then, oh, sorry, you're going to have to redo your schedule. Because well, it also <laughs> gets reset in the fall because you have to have mm-hmm. two witnesses in Jerusalem right. to see the new moon. And so, you know, unless and God can change our minds, I'm open to God changing me on anything, but until then, we're just going to s- yeah. stick with the regular. And I've got all I've got all of, of, of Ken, uh, Ken Johnson stuff that he did, he did on research on, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I have something a lot of people don't have. I've got his phone number so that I can, uh, he's a colleague, so I can call him if I have questions. And, and I, I may do that, I may not do that. But everything I've studied so far, when I'm looking at it, they used the spring equinox the same way that the, the pharisaical calendar set up on. They just calculate things a little different. And nobody mentions the barley harvest. That, that Moses, according to Moses, that if it was if it was not, uh, if it was not ripe yet, and so they so they could have their proper first fruits, they they added another month. Well, the Karite calendar does that, does but that. then you have the uh, the situation where who's in authority to to do that right now? Yeah. You know, and so and I know that we know about how the Rothschilds established everything, and and that Israel's in big trouble. We know all that, but you know, we just. It's just the way that God's got us doing it right now, and that's what we're going to stick to unless He tells us different. And we're we're just simply saying that because we've had so many emails mm-hmm. about it, and and uh, you and know, I people, understand. People I mean, people say, are you know, saying, what, "I want to do the right day." What <laughs> calendar do you use? Well, yeah. I pick up my regular calendar I get at uh, Staples, and usually they're right there. <laughs> Sometimes you have to look up the fall feast, but the things like Pentecost and and uh, and the Day of Atonement and and Passover is all right there. Even the Purim was on the one I had. So. Yeah, and so guys. God's in control, and even though the whole world looks like it's stuck on stupid, you know what? It has been since the very beginning, since mm-hmm. Babylon, it's been stuck on stupid. But the thing is, God has a people, God has a kingdom, and we're all called to walk in it. We're not of this world. We're in it. We're not of it. Love not the things of the world, but love the things of God. And Father, we just thank you for the remnant. Father, we ask that you would loosen us a tenacity like we never have before that we're going to lay a hold of the kingdom with both hands and we're not going to let go until it permeates every single part of our being spirit soul and body and we thank you and we praise you for it in jesus name Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.